martinis and continued with a fine bottle of wine. Noticing the reaction of the group to his question, he asked, I know you don't like to hear people call a lady a coon, but who is it? Um, so according to my numbers, things have changed a little bit, but not enough to forecast a trend. And when individuals receive accolades in an only somewhat changing world that is the same world that didn't recognize the genius of Gwendolyn Brooks and Robert Hayden and Amiri Baraka and Jay Wright, what then are we to do? And my answer is, I think we just keep counting. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming. And, and uh, I'm already looking forward to the discussion that, that we'll be having. Uh, we were asked to look at the history of contemporary poetry through the history of the National Book Award winners. And as uh, Elizabeth just pointed out, uh, those are overlapping histories, but they are not identical. No history of any single award could be. And I started to think about what kinds of history you could see through a book of poetry or through a set of awards. And there are at least four kinds. One is the history of the award itself, uh, about which there are good books. There's a good book on the history of prizes in general by someone named Pascal Casanova. Uh, and there are all sorts of inside baseball anecdotes about who got what prize in what year, and I'm sure we'll come back to more of them. But there are three larger kinds of history that you can see in a book of poetry, and I want us to keep them in mind. One is the history of poetry, what styles, what forms, what ways of using language become available when and why. One is the history of the country and the group and the audience in and through which the poetry is written, what we call current events, economic history, cultural history, military history uh, sometimes, uh, art history, uh, political history in a narrower sense. Uh, and the third is the history of the poet herself or himself, what happened in her life to enable her to write that way. And as I went down the list of winners, uh, it seemed to me that there was one book that brought, as in a burning glass, all those kinds of history together in a, a way that is still on fire for us now. It may not be the most uh, capacious or versatile book that has ever won the NBA, but it's one of the most influential, and to me it's one of the best, and that is Adrian Rich's book, Diving into the Wreck, which shared the award in 1974. And uh, I, I want to take a few minutes to see why what we think about that book uh, might be wrong. Uh, when we encounter that book now, we see it, uh, and not wholly wrongly, as the beginning of a line of durable and committed feminist poetry, the, the poetry that Rich went on to write in the 70s and the 80s as the leader of a movement, and we see it as part of a uh, an attempt, a public attempt, to get people to do things to make the world more just, to fix problems in public, not wholly unrelated to some of the historical injustices that Elizabeth, that you've just talked about. Not, not wholly unrelated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but when I went back to diving into the wreck and I reread it, uh, it seemed to me that it was a, a really tormented, troubled work that belonged uh, in some ways at the end of something, that saw itself as a kind of zero point in history, a book of anger that wasn't quite sure what to do with itself, uh, a, a book that stands out for its depiction of, of rage turned inward. Uh, against the poet herself, as well as outward against the society that had, had gone wrong and the language that had gone wrong and the traditions, the histories uh, that included, uh, for better and for worse, a lot of the previous winners of this award and a lot of the previous accomplishments of Western civilization. And it's a book where Rich is looking at herself and saying, what has done before won't do but I don't yet know what will. It is a zero point book. It is a frightening book. It is a book that gets remembered for its title poem, uh, a poem in which she imagines that she's Jacques Cousteau. Uh, she is a mermaid and a merman, and uh, the half destroyed instruments, I'm quoting, that once held to a course uh, in which she is the wreck. Uh, and that poem of watery investigation in some ways misrepresents the wonderful book to which it gave its title, because for most of the rest of that book, she's not underwater, she's on fire. Nine, I counted, of the 25 poems in that book end with something burning. Uh, and several others have rich on fire. Um, it's the last and the clearest of the, the books of self-division, of inner torment, of not being sure where to go at the end of an unjust system that Rich wrote. Uh, it's the first such book to reflect the death of her husband. And I, I'd wonder 
uh, looking at the reviews, how many reviewers were aware of what had happened. Uh, it's the last book before she began to write clearly as a lesbian feminist, the identity that informed so much of her best later poetry. Uh, and it's a book about not being able to start over yet, a book that still, I'm tempted to say, has no proper sequel, or not until recently. Um, and I just want to end by discussing some of the best lines. Uh, I've got a minute or two. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is a book in a state of incipience. Abel, Rich says, to feel the fiery future of every matchstick in the kitchen, imagining the existence of something uncreated. Uh, and that imagination is there in the book's style, a language grainier, more pulverized, more attentive to the present moment because it's more cut off from its own history than any American style that came before it. Um, it is strange to be so many women Rich says, it's a classic instance of consciousness raising, of thinking about herself as not just part of her own history. But then, uh, the self-division, the ambivalence, the roughness that is excluded from that kind of public speech, that Rich excludes from her diction, gets into the other parts of the, the book, uh, into the, the rough line, uh, into the fragmentation of those poems. And since it's a book that when we go back to it, when our students send us back to it today, we get sent back to the public poems, like Diving into the Rack, the title poem, I want to end by reading some of my favorite stanzas from one of the poems of inwardness, of self-division, of, of, well, you'll see. It's a poem called Song, If I'm Lonely. It's a poem where she is, those histories don't define her. She doesn't know what does. If I'm lonely, she says, it must be the loneliness of waking first, of breathing dawn's first cold breath, on the city, of being the one awake in a house wrapped in sleep. If I'm lonely, it's with the rowboat ice fast on the shore in the last red light of the year that knows what it is, that knows it's neither ice nor mud nor winter light, but wood with a gift for burning. Um. Thank you for coming, I'm happy to be here. Um, this winter, one of the books I was reading was Jim Long and Box, by coincidence, his wonderful early critical book called The Stone Cottage, about the relationship between William Butler Gates and Ezra Pound, the Irish poet already famous in 1908 when they met, the American unknown 20 years younger, um, but with plenty of arrogance and genius of his own. And for several years, they, they were roomies. They were, they, they were dorm mates in Yates' Stone Cottage in, S, in Sussex, which is what Jim's book is about. And they formed a relationship which served them very well. Um, uh, Pound threw out adjectives and abstractions from Yates's poems. And Yates taught uh, Pound something about the tensility of lines and even maybe more important, the notion that poetry should be visionary and that it should have nobility of mind, something Yates thought of as mobility of mind. And, Eventually, they, you know, they, 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 they had their poetic fights, and they came to uh, respect and, and, in fact, flatter each other. But, um, and, and Pound came to respect Yeats' stoicism, and Yeats felt that Pound had found some kind of true nobility. So in our, emo in, in our poetic friendships and the way I approach a poem um, is with this mixture of faith, um, of goodwill, and skepticism with willingness and openness on the one hand and also a desire to test the work and to be tested by it. You can tell when a poetic friendship, a friendship between you and a, a poet friend has ended its active phase when the work stops being questioned and seen freshly and when the reader is no longer to say, well, that really doesn't work or to be skeptical. And so that seems to me to be the relationship of the National Book Award to poetry. Um, and, you know, so I'm sort of speaking in praise of combativeness and skepticism as well as goodwill. In this sense, a, an institution like the NBA, as we will all say, I'm surely, surely is, is both a friend and a corrective critic of their particular moment in poetry. It mediates between literature and culture at large and also between poetry and poetry, between, between poets and poetry. And so it requires a combination of faith, investment, and skepticism, and toughness, and willingness to change, because it shapes cultural memory. It puts the X on the map that says where the gold is hidden, and it has a pretty good record. But I know the subject tonight is, is lineage and, and the poetry list, and it's a fantastic catalog to scroll, to scroll through. It's quite reliable for its recognitions of genius, and all of these books would reward rereading. Their consistency of quality is remarkable. There are also these, these names um, on the list which seem daring, even from the present perspective. Um, 
they show a sense of adventure and nerve. The selection, for example, of William Bronk in 1982 is kind of a shock. Theodore Rethke's Words for the Wind in 1959, Robert Bly's 1968 book collection, The Light Around the Body, and Diving into the Wreck, an amazingly raw book to have been chosen by a panel of readers even in 1974, or Eyes collection, selected poems in 1999. The panelists who made those prescient and aberrant selections can be proud of their faith in urgent originality and strangeness. Adam Zagajewski, the Polish poet, says, reading books, we forget what battles were fought on every page. And in reading the National Book Award, we forget, forget every battle that was fought in a back room. So I'm praising the uncooked. And I, you know, you put the diving into the wreck by, by Rich or James Dickey's Buck Dancer's Choice, another radical choice next to life studies, and they seem practically <clears throat> demented ferociously <laughs> irrational in different ways. Dickey's and Rich's poems are amazing in many ways, but they're also aesthetically really imperfect. Rich's revolutionary insistence on roughing up and defacing speech is now a career-long fact, but back then it must have been seemed to some like an insult. Likewise, these long, irregular, stuttering tides of language across Buck Dancer's choice are wild in every way. The Shark's Parlor, the, the insane poem, Slave Quarters, the fire bombing. Dickey is a poet whose conviction and mysticism is being forgot for the moment, but he's a remarkable poet. I hope he'll be remembered. In their ways, these two books are deliberately, deliberately embody anti-aesthetic, which is, of course, quintessentially American. But it's all the more remarkable that the NBA recognized them because there is nothing more challenging to recognize for an institution than irrationality. It's anti-institutional in its nature. So given this dialectic between faith and caution, nerve, skepticism, refinement, instinct, it seems worthwhile to me to point out what, some, what my colleagues already have, that some of these books were chosen for cultural reasons, and others were more distinctly chosen for their aesthetic perfection or their aesthetic gen grandeur truth and beauty. One, some were attractive for beauty, and some were attractive for power of a less elegant sort. Though we often pretend, we often pretend, it is not so. There really is a difference between these two standards. Most anthology, uh, the category of what is culturally timely, significant, and necessary is just not as universal as these other kinds of standards of, 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 of glories of craft um, or vision. I want to talk about The Light Around the Body, chosen in 1968 by Robert Bly. Um, and that book, and also Adrian Rich's Diving Into the Wreck, were chosen in advocacy of certain cultural forces. In fact, they were chosen for, but for political reasons. For the motive of importing or allowing or sponsoring the entrance of a needed kind of imagination into the culture. Some poems are important for cultural reasons. If NBA committees were immune to or above such choices, the NBA would be a more Mandarin and a more arid institution. So one, the moment I want to focus on in Robert, is Robert Bly's second book. It was recognized in 1968, and um, it's full of both politics and irrationality. I personally believe that Robert Bly is a great American cultural figure. In his lifetime, he's brought more energy, more ideas, and more technique into American poetry than can almost be counted. The, the international poetry, Vallejo, Transtromer, Kabir, his political energy, which includes a ferocious critique of capitalism, American complacency and complicity, and of masculinity, uh, an unguarded allegiance to spiritual vision and poetic traditions of spiritual ecstasy, prolonged advocacy of the particular poetic powers of the image, and of many traditions of associative intelligence in poetry. This is an eclectic, impressive, contradictory bunch of hobby horses. More than these, most of these tributary forces are represented in the light around the body. And now I get to read some of the lines. I want to begin with this particular category and flavor in the light around the body um, with uh, satire and tragic comedy. So here's the beginning of a poem called The Great Society. Dentists continue to water their lawns even in the rain. Hands developed with terrible labor by apes hang from the sleeves of evangelists. There are murdered kings in the light bulbs outside movie theaters. The coffins of the poor are hibernating in piles of new towers, new tires. So it's often been pointed out that Robert Bly is not an especially musical poet. The extreme emphasis of his aesthetic, his aesthetic places on the image tends to displace lyricism if any were to be had. 
Instead of being lyrical, he's a declarative poet whose favorite tool is the statement, more usually a series of statements, each one loaded with images like buckshot. I'm going to